There's a lot more to candles than lights the eye. Before they were invented, people relied on candles made with wicks floating in flammable, spillable oil. In the past, candles weren't just used for illumination. Since they burn at such a steady rate, people have even used them as clocks. Thanks to electricity, candles no longer have to illuminate our homes. They can simply brighten our evenings with atmospheric lighting. This wax has been made into a powder with a rotating bar that sprays drops of hot wax into the air. As the drops fall, they cool and become solid wax particles. A specialized machine called a core press vacuums the powder and begins a multi-step process. A series of small tube-shaped holes are filled with powder. Then hydraulic pistons compress the powder into short cylinders. Transport units move them to the next station. The compressed wax cylinder will form the core of the candle and prevent the burning wick from touching the edges of the glass. First, the candle needs a wick and a sustainer. The metal sustainer is the wick's base. This machine shoots wicks into the sustainers, crimps them, and inserts the components into the candle core. A machine places drops of glue in the bottom of a series of small glass containers before placing the candle cores inside. The glue holds the sustainers in place to prevent them from sliding around when hot. On to the next phase of production, liquefied wax is poured into a mixing tank. A technician pours in a series of additives that include plasticizers to help solidify the wax and prevent crystallization, as well as UV light inhibitors that can protect the wax from color fading. He pours a pre-measured quantity of dye into the container. An agitator begins the mixing process, which takes 20 to 30 minutes to ensure that everything is thoroughly combined. The wax temperature is maintained at 185 degrees Fahrenheit, so the liquid is kept in its liquid state. Then, the liquid wax travels through tubing to a computerized filling station. A set of nozzles fill the jars, surrounding and covering the cores. Once filled, the jars move slowly through two separate cooling chambers. The candles undergo extensive quality control testing for flame height and temperature on the exterior of the container. This facility also manufactures tea light candles. The containers are made of aluminum alloy pressed into a cup shape with small panels at the bottom designed to direct melted wax to the center. Moved by air, the containers fall into a sorter which spins them into an upright position and onto a conveyor that offloads them to the next stations. Like candles, tea lights require sustainers and glue to hold the wick in place. The steel discs drop into a vibrating sorting device. A giant spool of waxed thread is fed into the wicking machine. The machine cuts and inserts it into the sustainer clip and glues the assembly into a tea light container. The containers, with sustainers and wicks in place, move to a circular buffering table which disperses into three channels. A multi-pronged device advances the containers onto the filling machine's conveyor system. The machine fills the containers in a two-step process, filling them halfway, letting them cool, then filling them up and cooling the completed product. The two-step filling process ensures a consistent product at a faster manufacturing rate. The cooling chamber circulates air through the space at a specific temperature to cool the candles at a calibrated rate. From start to finish, it takes just 45 minutes to produce and package a tea light. There's a lot more to that cozy candle glow than just wax and wicks. A hammer is an all-purpose tool most commonly used to strike nails. 
Some hammers are designed for a specific purpose, such as woodworking, metalworking, and masonry. Professional craftspeople often forego mass-produced tools and invest in high-quality, hand-forged hammers. The steel head of this hammer was forged by a blacksmith. This is just one out of 40 different styles of hammers made by a blacksmith. Using a metal cutting bandsaw, a blacksmith cuts a piece of cylindrical steel. He makes the cut slightly larger than the final hammerhead size. Next, he burns a small amount of paper on coals in a cast steel pot. A fan located underneath the coals blows air upward to stoke the fire. Once the coals are hot, the craftsman immerses the steel piece in the fire. Once the steel is bright red, he removes the piece from the fire with tongs. He begins striking it with a mechanical forging hammer operated by a foot pedal. Throughout the forging process, the steel is reheated to keep it formable. The craftsman lowers the pedal, which activates the machine's hammer. As the hammer strikes, the craftsman turns the cylindrical piece of steel to flatten the sides and shape it into a block. Using a specialized tool, he makes a punch on the block to form a channel. He flips the block and punches out the compressed steel to create a hole. This hole is the eye of the hammer. Next, the craftsman uses a tool called a spring swage to flatten one end of the block into the wedge-shaped end of the hammer, known as the peen. Each side of the peen is shaped against a grinding wheel to even out the surface. Working on an anvil, the craftsman flattens the block with a handheld hammer. then with a tool called a flatter. He uses an oval eye contouring tool to hammer a hole to form the eye. Now complete, the craftsman polishes the hammerhead on a series of grinding belts. Then the hammerhead is placed back into the fire for more reheating. Back on the anvil, he uses a wire brush to remove scale caused by oxidation. Then brands the steel with his name. After heat treating both ends of the hammerhead to harden the steel at the striking surfaces, he finishes off the metalwork with a die grinder, smoothing the sharp edges around the eye and forming a bevel. Once complete, the craftsman moves on to the wooden handle. He shapes a block of wood, often using hickory, with an angle grinder. Using a grinding wheel, he shaves off the top to fit in the eye of the hammerhead. With a bandsaw, he makes a two-inch cut into the wood. He cuts a wedge out of a softer type of wood, usually pine. He marks the diameter of the eye on the wedge, then sands off the excess wood so that the wedge will fit in the eye. He inserts the split end of the wood handle in the eye, forcing it through. Then he hammers the wedge into the split. This pushes the two sides of the split in opposite directions, lodging the handle in the eye. Next, the craftsman hammers in a hollow round steel wedge until it's flush with the hammerhead. The wedge spreads the wood in different directions, locking in the handle. He removes excess wood with an angle grinder until the top of the hammer is level and smooth. Finally, this handmade tool is ready to make its contribution to hand craftsmanship.